Last month, we've been talking about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, looking at what Jews at the time of Jesus believed about different subjects and um, talking together about how those beliefs apply to our own discussions of key values and uh, questions, theologically and otherwise. And uh, then starting next time, we are going to go into the church period, the early church period, and talk about um, the disciples in the first hundred years of the church, the first two hundred years, talk about how they continue these Jewish themes, but then we're really asking other questions, like who is Jesus, what is his significance, how does he filter into this Jewish world of belief, and um, so we're going to switch gears in the uh, next class and move beyond this early Jewish period. But today, we're talking about questions of the age to come. We'll close this door here. And last week, we talked about this Jewish concept that they call the age to come and talked about uh, what that means for Jews in the time of Jesus. Today we're going to talk about another aspect of the age to come. Last week we talked about the life of the age to come. This week we're talking about what's known as the punishment of the age to come. It's a little darker subject, but I think an important subject because um, this is a key part of the Jewish faith, and it becomes a key part of the Christian faith. And you can ask, well, is this a key part of the ethical dimension of reality as well? Right? How does our wrongdoing relate to our relationships? That's the question we're talking about today. How are ethics important for relationships, right? I'm guessing that some of your best friends are probably friends who don't steal from you, friends you're not afraid are going to kill you, friends that uh, you, know, you don't think are going to lie to you, <coughs> and so on. So you guys, well, what makes a good friend? You might think that an ethical friend is a good friend, or maybe like friends who are ethical. Think about sustained relationship. What sort of person do you want to marry? What sort of person do you want to be married to? Or if you're already married, what do you want your spouse to be like? Right? And you think about how relationships and ethics tie together. What does one do with wrongdoing? What is the metaphor here in the Christian faith? Jesus refers to God as Father. That's a parental image. So we can ask questions like this. Are all humans God's children? And if God is Father, does that mean we're all children? Or are only some of us children and others something else, right? So if you think about this first question, are all humans God's children? Does God want all of his children to be healed and saved? <coughs> if it's true that humans are God's children, what about those wayward children? Those children that uh, aren't really doing God's will. The children that uh, you know, have ideas of their own. What does God do with them? And what um, should God do with them? Does God abandon them? That's a key question Jews were asking. Maybe not with the children metaphor so much. Israel was seen as God's children. But some Jews would say the Gentiles were as well. Um, even though Jesus made it very explicit by talking about God's Father. But does God ever abandon his children? And what role does death play in this? Does death seal our destiny? Is our destiny eternal? Last week we talked about the life of the age to come. And we said that some Jews believe that this life was about 500 years, so it's not an eternal destiny. Other Jews thought it was unending, eternal life, incorruptible, indestructible life. The New Testament goes with the latter Jewish opinion. Yes, this life is without death, the word athanatos. But... We can say, okay, well, what does death have to do with this? Are we sealed into our place after death? What role does punishment play? Is there punishment after death? Is there punishment in this life of the age to come? How did first century Jews see this? The Jewish answer was yes, but what was the nature of this punishment, we can ask? How long does it last? What is it like? What is its purpose? Does it have a purpose? Is it a matter of vengeance? Is it a matter of correction? Right? Is it a matter of parental discipline? These are the questions we're going to be talking about today. And what do you have to do to get punished? How bad do you have to be? That's another interesting question. That was a focus of Jewish debate 
So this whole discussion, pretty much, I'll have a, a couple of glimpses of Jesus to contextualize where he's coming from, but this whole discussion pretty much today is going to be Jewish, but it's Jewish right at the time of Jesus. So we're talking about 50 years before Jesus, during the life of Jesus, and a little bit afterwards, and nothing I'm going to show you today is going to be from a period that's later Judaism. So this is uh, Judaism at the time of Jesus. And last time, we talked about Judaism at the time of Jesus as being a tale of two ages. There's the present age, which is not a happy place for a lot of us. Right? Last week we talked about, well, is there anything wrong with this present age? And there wasn't one person in this room that said, uh, no, it's perfect. This is a wonderful age. Couldn't improve on it. Right? No one was of that opinion. So Jews thought that too. They said, well, the present age was pretty bad. And uh, N.T. Wright, New Testament scholars, says virtually all Second Temple Jews this is Jews at the time of Jesus that he's talking about, and before Jesus as well, with the possible exception of the aristocracy, the aristocracy being the Sadducees, who we talked about in the first class, with the possible exception of Sadducees, who were, they were pretty well-to-do, they were pretty established, so they thought life was pretty good. But other Jews believed that the present age was a time of sorrow, a time of exile, this is the age we're living in, and this would be succeeded by the age to come, in which wrongs would be righted, and Israel's God would set up his kingdom. Jesus talks about this, right? If you've ever heard the expression, the kingdom of God, he's talking about the beginning of this next age, this age to come. And um, so we can break it down this way. Jews at the time of Jesus, except Sadducees, believe that there were two ages, those that followed God's commands, who were called the righteous or the just, Right, so how, how are you righteous? Well, you follow God's commands according to these Jews. You live righteously. That means taking care of the poor, taking care of the widow, taking care of the orphan. That means following God's commandments, like the Ten Commandments. Don't steal. Don't uh, kill anyone. Right? Um, and things like that. Don't lie. These are the folks who inherit our life in the age to come. But if you ignore God's commandments, said these Jews, if you disregard God's commands, you are unjust. You're an unjust person, and they called unjust people sinners or unrighteous. Right? So this word sinners means those who well, are not just, those who don't like justice, don't like God's commandments. Justice is seen as the fulfillment of God's commandments, as the purpose of God's command commandments, justice and righteousness. What happens to these folks? Well, they inherit the punishment of the age to come. Two phrases that we find in the New Testament as well, in Greek. And the words there we talked about last week, zoe ionios, the life of the age to come. And then there's this other side known as the colossus ionios. So we talked about that Greek phrase today and what Jews meant when they uh, used that phrase. So the age to come. In the Mishnah, and uh, parts of it that go back to the time of Jesus, the rabbis agreed that all Israel will inherit the life of the age to come. And uh, we actually see this in the New Testament in Romans 11, I think 26 or 27, 28, something like that. Paul says, all Israel shall be saved. And this is a very Jewish view. Paul is saying, yes, I'm a rabbi, I'm a Pharisee, and I believe this, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will inherit life of the age to come, many rabbis, such as Rabbi Hillel, one of the main Jewish schools of thought, Hillel and Shammai, were the big two, and their tension is the entire sort of contemporary rabbinic Judaism. Jews often said that uh, Shammai binds and Hillel loosens, right? Uh, Shammai was more conservative, more strict. Hillel, a little bit more liberal, and uh, we can see this in their positions. Hillel and Rabbi Joshua also would say that righteous Gentiles would also inherit a share of the age to come. So not just Jews, but also Gentiles. You don't even have to be kosher to inherit this life in the age to come. So long as you follow God's commands, as long as you're just and a uh, good person. And um, here we find in uh, an early Jewish writing an expression of this, whoever has Torah, good deeds, humility, and fear of heaven will be saved from punishment in Gehenna. So a very early reference to Gehenna, pre-New Testament reference to Gehenna. And we can say, okay, uh, interesting. These Jews are talking about Gehenna, which in the New Testament, depending on your translation, 
sometimes is kept as Gehenna. It's an Aramaic word. We'll talk about where it comes from. Sometimes translated as hell. Right? So you say, okay, well, um, what should it be translated as? What's part of this concept? What did Jews think? That's the question we're asking today. But these rabbis agreed that how do you get saved from Gehenna? Well, you get saved from punishment by following Torah, continuing humility, and fear of heaven. Heaven is a euphemism for God. Jews didn't say God's name or even the term God because um, it was too sacred. So they, they would use heaven. So kingdom of heaven is actually the same as the kingdom of God. It's just a euphemism. And uh, so whenever you see heaven, I tend to put it in uh, scare quotes. So it's a euphemism. Rabbi Akiva says, the world is judged with goodness and not according to the majority of one's deeds. It's interesting because here he's arguing that God is a God of grace. God is judging with goodness, with God's goodness, with righteousness. And thus, even if some of our deeds are not so great, even the majority of our deeds are not so great, God can see our hearts. And so there is this early Jewish concept of grace. Rabbi Hillel extends that grace quite widely and says, uh, Most of humankind who are neither utterly wicked nor saintly will not see Gehenna at all. Right? So you feel like, oh, you know, I could use some improvement. I'm not the best person in the world. I've never murdered anyone or you know, did anything too nasty. Never, you know, uh, you know, think about your hierarchy of sins and what you would add to that. <laughs> right? We do that for you. But um, most of humankind are neither wicked, utterly wicked, nor saints. You won't see Gehenna at all. Lots of grace in Hillel's view. Again, Hillel is writing before Jesus, and uh, that's one opinion. On the other side, there's the school of thought that are known as the, Gale uh, the rabbis from Galilee, the Galileans, who Jesus would have been familiar with, and also the uh, school of Shammai. They say transgressions against God's law and against others had to be atoned for and punishable, or punishable in the Gehenna after death. So these were folks who said, if you break God's law, you have to pay in Gehenna. And, um, you know, a lot less grace, you might say. You say, well, what's the function of Gehenna with these rabbis? Uh, what's the nature of this punishment? What gets you into Gehenna? Well, most rabbis believe that um, if you did not live according to Torah, you'd be punished in Gehenna, especially the school of Shammai. And we can say that uh, things that include, as very serious sins, idolatry, to have gods other than God, right? To uh, you go <laughs> worshiping in the temple of Zeus, or Athena, or Artemis, or what have you, right? Showing up at these other temples, <laughs> doing pagan sacrifices. Um, depending on the rabbis, they would apply this in different ways. What counts as idolatry? Worshiping money. Can count as idolatry with some of these rabbis. We hear that in Jesus as well. God chooses between God and money. You can't have both as your master. So that's a big one. Incest. They didn't like incest. We don't like incest. So um, you know, maybe the maybe these are both easy for you. Okay, I'm doing good so far. Um, adultery, another tough one. Right? Do we find this in the New Testament, taken very seriously, cheating on your spouse? Pride! Whew. Pride. <laughs> That's a tough one. Yes. <laughs> Make America great again, right? <laughs> uh, lots of pride. Dude, okay. Humility. I mean, I need to work on that. So we can say, okay, um, maybe you're in, maybe you're out. What's the role of sin? Well, these are the main sins they talk about. You know, others would add other sins as well, depending on the rabbi, but there's general agreement upon these. And how do you get out of Gehenna? The big way to get out was in the Hebrew, teshuva, or metanoia in the Greek. Metanoia in the Greek literally means to change your mind, to transform your mind, change your ways, turn around. Sometimes um, we hear it translated as that. Change your way of thinking about reality. Transform your mind. Right? Change your heart. And uh, repentance. It's often translated as repentance in the New Testament. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? 
life is a very Jewish idea that John the Baptist is saying in Jesus' early ministry, repent. <clears throat> Turn around. You're going on the wrong path. Take a different path. The path of justice. The path of God's ways. Repentance is the remedy to Gehenna. And most rabbis would say that even after death, you can have repentance. And this is interesting when you find these rabbis saying, even if you're standing at the very gates of Gehenna, you've died, you see the fires, and there you are standing at the gates, and um, it's not too late to repent. Right? So even at the very gates of Gehenna, there's repentance. Hillel and the Mishnah say that uh, death in itself, even the process of dying, has a certain amount of atonement, the process of realizing that you're not going to be here anymore, that you're getting close to the end, that uh, Gehenna may be approaching, there's something atoning for that, that might even save you from Gehenna. But, they would say, what you won't be saved from is the sin of leading others astray. And even the Hillelites would make exceptions for several individuals in Jewish history, and uh, those are Jeroboam, Ahab, and Manasseh. And many scholars believe this tradition goes back before uh, the accounts of the Bible from Manasseh were written, because we read in the account of Manasseh that Manasseh actually repented, but the rabbis who are writing don't acknowledge that at all, so it seems like they're not even aware of that. So this is a tradition that goes back earlier than the biblical accounts we have of Manasseh. And uh, some, some later rabbis would not include Manasseh because... In the Bible, it says he repents. But the idea is, if you are in leadership over a whole nation, and you lead a whole nation astray, well, you're not getting out of your head out. No way, right? <laughs> you need major punishment because you've led so many into Gehenna. So, um, so leaders are especially accountable. We see this in the New Testament. Teachers are held especially accountable, right? And so this is a very Jewish idea. And we say, okay, well, um, what's the nature of Gehenna? How long does it last? What is it like? Um, how do we get out of it? How does forgiveness happen? We can start with this first question, how does forgiveness happen? And if we look at the rabbis, and these are the Pharisees, again, when I say rabbis, I mean Pharisees. Jesus was called rabbi, so people would have saw him as a Pharisee in terms of the social context. He wasn't a Sadducee. You don't see Jesus making sacrifices in the temple. He wasn't in a scene. He was not out in Qum Qumran, baptizing people and praying for the nation, isolated, trying to create a new culture. He's among the people. He's teaching scripture among the people. This is what Pharisees did. So even if he had problems with the Pharisees, he would have been seen as a Pharisee because people call him rabbi. And so and he enters into these debates. So how are sins forgiven? Well, in the present age, the Pharisees said sins are forgiven through temple sacrifices. You make your temple sacrifice. That's one way sins are forgiven. But the other way, especially, is through repentance. You don't even have to make sacrifices. If you repent, you confess before God, you change your heart, you change your mind, then your sins are forgiven. So even the Pharisees are saying you don't need the temple for forgiveness of sins. All you need is repentance. And if you think about where the Pharisees are coming from, in the first class, we talked about the Babylonian exile. Here you have a whole, several generations of Jews away from the temple. What do you do when you don't have a temple? The temple's destroyed. How are my sins forgiven if the temple's destroyed? Repentance becomes the new sacrifice for Pharisees. Right? Um, in the age to come, they believed that forgiveness of sins could happen in Gehenna. So there's lots of discussion in um, writings of these rabbis of the fires of Gehenna doing expiation. They talk about expiation, right? Um, which is a sort of purging, perhaps, I don't know, uh, you know taking away, removal. Somehow, <coughs> somehow Gehenna removes sins, right? They don't really go into details of how. Somehow Gehenna removes sins in the age to come. Or divine grace, God might just forgive you. There's debate. Hillel would say more grace, maybe a little bit of Gehenna and a lot of grace. Shammai would say, well, maybe a lot of Gehenna and a little of grace. Right? So, Hillel binds, or Shammai binds, Hillel loosens, right? Sort of like you think about tight, you know, you're tying something tighter, 
And then I'm going to loosen that up. It's a little, a little bit too tight. It's constraining. I can't breathe. <laughs> right, too tight. In Messianic age, there's a special type of forgiveness that Jews talked about. And this I find fascinating because of Jesus, right? If you think about Jesus as the Messiah, that's what Christians say. That's Christ. Christ means Messiah. So we call Jesus our Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? Christos, anointed one in Greek. In the Messianic age, there's a sort of corporate forgiveness through pure divine grace that has to do with the Messiah, the suffering servant of Israel, leading a life of suffering, right, on behalf of God. So there's some special forgiveness that the Messiah is able to bring all of Israel through suffering, through a life of suffering. And we find this also in the Jewish tradition. When the Messiah comes, there will be major forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins will exude from his very being through his life of suffering. And you think, okay, do we see anything about this in Jesus? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of this idea that enters into the New Testament descriptions of Jesus. But we find it uh, in Aramaic Targum as well before Jesus, talking about this idea. And there's a Targum in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant that has this idea. Interestingly, the Essenes... We're a group of priests who says that the current temple sacrifices are worthless because they're not done by righteous priests. The priests are wicked. The priests are, you know, totally in with Roman culture, going to the theater, going to the gymnasium, watching the nude exercising, which we talked about in the first class. And uh, these priests are not worthy of doing sacrifices, so God detests these sacrifices. And you can see Old Testament verses that talk about this. What is the way forgiveness of sins is accomplished for the Essenes? This is the community John the Baptist was part of, most scholars believe. Well, they say sin is atoned for and forgiveness is obtained whenever a man or woman sees the error of his or her way and turns from it in humility and a right spirit. There we have that. Turn from it. Metanoia. Repent. Right? So the Essenes are saying sacrifices are worthless. Repentance is how God forgives sins. This is how you atone for your sins. Whoever does not repent sincerely, but clings to falsehood, clings to lies, clings to error, clings to injustice, excludes him or herself from forgiveness and from the new covenant. This is the Essene view. You might hear echoes of this in the New Testament when you think about forgiveness of sin. So that's how sin is forgiven. We can ask other questions. Uh, well, what about Jesus, right? We talked about various issues. First of all, who goes to Gehenna? The rabbinic debate. How is forgiveness of sins accomplished? And uh, we can turn to Jesus and find him talking about Gehenna, using the same phrases, Zoe Colossus Ionios, the punishment of the age to come, and Zoe Ionios, the life of the age to come. These are stock phrases for these early rabbis. Everyone used them. Jesus uses these same phrases. This is from the uh, Revised English Version. He's talking about the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and that's Jesus, he calls himself the Son of Man. I think in the second class, we talked about what does he mean by Son of Man. Well, this is a, a, a divine figure at this time, who is the Messiah. So Jesus is making major claims of authority by calling himself the Son of Man. So when the Son of Man comes, he will also say to those on his left, and these people <laughs> calling him Lord, acknowledging him as Lord. He says, depart from me into the fire of the coming age, right? The fire of the age to come. For I was hungry, and you did not give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. They will go away to the punishment of the age to come, to the righteous and to the life of the age to come. So think about the rabbinic context. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, well, your deeds matter. Even if you call me Lord... Your deeds matter, right? You can't just ignore people on the streets. You can't ignore the homeless. You can't ignore the prisoner. You can't ignore those who are suffering. This is a very Jewish view, and he's somewhere between Hillel and Shammai on this, right? He's somewhere in between them. Um, deeds matter. It's not, you, know, you don't get out of Gehenna very easily, right? And uses the same terms. So we can put him in context, and there's a much larger conversation we'll talk about in a later context when we talk about how does the New Testament incorporate this stuff. 
We can say, okay, well, what are the meanings of these terms? And if you want a very long discussion, if you're into reading long books on Greek, this is a good one. <laughs> um, it's a whole big book that's uh, was it 300 pages or something like that on two Greek terms. Um, <laughs> Ios and I Ideos uh, are two Greek terms for eternity. And um, their conclusion is that Ionios doesn't mean eternal. If you look at the, the context of the word, how it's used in the New Testament, only in Plato does it mean eternal. Plato becomes significant for the early church. And thus, some church thinkers in, incorporate Plato's idea of eternal into the New Testament. But um, it says in general, right, it's associated with life or punishment. And um, when it's talking about life or punishment in the Bible, and the Christian authors who keep themselves close to the biblical, and I, I added early here because they're talking about early Jewish usage especially, these are the Jews we're talking about. This is how they use these terms. It belongs to their, it has to do with their belonging to the age to come. So this is how we're using it. And this is uh, the revised English version is a newer translation that has a lot of appendices talking about incorporating this Jewish scholarship into a modern translation and thus life of the age to come, punishment of the age to come, as opposed to eternal life and eternal punishment. Right. And even with that, you can start to see, wait a second, what are we talking about here? The translation is just getting rid of eternal punishment based on scholarship of early Judaism? Okay, theological relevance becomes immediately apparent, but we're still talking about the, Jew, the Jews here, excuse me. And then we can say, okay, that's how we can translate these terms. That's there's a good scholarly consensus on this. I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, what about Colossus? This phrase, Colossus. Punishment, as it's translated in the New Testament. The original root of this is pruning or correction. And we find this um, in the context of trimming trees or vines to improve them, help them to grow, to bear fruit. <laughs> this is an idea that uh, New Testament scholar William Barclay says, you know, this originally meant the pruning of trees to make them grow better. And Barclay says, in all of Greek secular literature, so in the Septuagint, this is used, but he says, in all of the Greek secular literature, if you look at philosophers or uh, you know, pretty much anyone, you know, people writing legal treatises, look at all your Greek secular literature, and you will find that this is never used of anything but remedial punishment. This is punishment to make people better. There are different types of punishments. And we could go to uh, some more ancient sources. Aristotle lived several hundred years before Jesus, right? 